Hi, everybody. Welcome to this webinar. I'm James Heimowitz. I'm the president of China Institute, and it's a great honor to welcome all of you. For those of you who know China Institute, welcome back. For those of you who are just joining us, China Institute has been around for 95 years, founded in 1926 to help Americans better understand China through education, through art, through culture, through business, and through current events like what's happening now. We've been through all kinds of disruptions. We've seen all kinds of upheavals. Um, but one thing China Institute does believe in is collaboration, engagement. That doesn't mean we have to agree with everything that goes on in Beijing or Washington, but it does mean that we have to figure out ways to work together because we believe firmly that China and the United States are probably the two most important countries to occupy this planet for the next chunk of time. And the things that China does and the things that the United States does have a tremendous impact not only on those two countries, but on the whole world. So we're delighted to welcome a perspective from Asia as well as a North American perspective. Um, I just wanna put a little note in and say, you know, China Institute has been on site. We've been um, on site at Washington Street now for nearly five years, a beautiful new space. And we are transitioning um, to the example of that from on site to online. So even though our physical premise is closed at the moment, we are very much open. We're very much here making sure that we are helping to shepherd the dialogue. And I just got news this morning, our Center for Contemporary China, which is gonna be a beautiful space, uh, downstairs on the ground floor, construction will move ahead as soon as we get off this pause that's been imposed on us and everybody else in New York and in the country. Um, so that's some good news. Anyway, you didn't come here to listen to me. We all came for what's going to be a fascinating discussion today with Kishore Mabubani, Graham Allison, and uh, a moderator by Rana Frohar. Um, so without further ado, let me pass it over to our Director of Programs, Dinda Elliott, who's helped put this whole thing together. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Dinda Elliott, um, Director of Programs, as Jane mentioned. And um, we've launched a series of, a, a mini series of programs to um, look at the world during and after this crisis. And today, our first, as you know, we'll look at the rise of China and what it will mean for navigating the new world order. Um, next week, we're doing one with um, Chinese, young Chinese restaurateurs and delivery service entrepreneurs who are trying to retool in an effort to survive the crisis. And the week after that, we've got Wang Huiyao, who's the president of the Center for China and Globalization, uh, talking with Pin Ni, the president of Wanxiang USA, about um, business tactics to survive the crisis and uh, what the business landscape will look like, US-China collaboration and what the business landscape will look like after the crisis. So I really hope that you will tune in to all of these programs and much more to come. Um, a little quick housekeeping note, we will take questions um, at the end. And uh, what you do is at the bottom of your screen, you will see us, a, a, an icon that says participants or attendees. And if you click on that, or it, it, I think you, you, you click on raise hand at the bottom. And if you raise your hand uh, at the end of the, uh, you know, towards the end when we take questions from the, from the audience, uh, you know, we will call on your, call your name, and then you'll be able to ask your question in person. Um, I am delighted to report that we have more than 100, I think 110, 115 people on this call today, which is um, very exciting and um, lots of uh, thought leaders tuning in. So thank you all so much for joining. And it's now my great pleasure to kick off this series with two of the world's great public intellectuals, Kishore Mabubani and Graham Allison, moderated by one of the leading journalists of our day, Rana Faruhar. Kishore has been Singapore's top strategic thinker for decades. He was a close advisor to Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew and has served in many top government positions, including ambassador to the, to the United Nations. He's written many books, most, mostly controversial, I might add, um, and his latest, Has China Won?, has just been published. I want to give a very special shout out to Kishore for agreeing to do this event in the middle of the night in Singapore. So thank you for that, Kishore. 
Um, Graham Allison has taught government at Harvard for the last five decades. He was the founding dean of Harvard's John, John F. Kennedy School of Government and was an assistant secretary of defense in the first Clinton administration. Graham's latest book, an international bestseller called Destined for War, sparked a seminal debate about whether the United States and China can avoid Thucydides trap in which the ancient Greek historian postulated that the rise of Athens and the fear that this instilled in Sparta made war inevitable. Rana Faruhar is global business uh, columnist at the Financial Times and CNN's global economic analyst. Her book, Makers and Takers, The Rise of Finance and the Fall of American Business, explains why the capital markets no longer support business. And her most recent book, Don't Be Evil, How Big Tech Betrayed Its, is, is Don't Be Evil, How Big Tech Betrayed Its Founding Principles and All of Us. We are so thrilled to have these thought leaders take on some of the big questions of the day. So Rana, um, we will message you um, at around 1.40 when it might be time to take some questions from the audience. Um, and over to you, Rana. Thank you so okay, much. Great, great. Thanks so much, Dinda. Thanks to Kishore and Graham, and thanks to everyone who's joined in. It's really a, an honor and a privilege to be able to, to moderate this conversation. Uh, so as Dinda said, we're gonna speak for about 30 minutes or so, and then we're gonna open it up for questions, hopefully have a vibrant conversation. Um, and let me just start really, I mean, <laughs> it's hard to know where to start because there's so much right now, um, but let me jump right into the crisis. I mean, even before COVID-19, we had a situation between the US and China a shift in global order that was encompassing every possible kind of change, geopolitical change, uh, change to the global economic system, uh, security. Now we're in the middle of a health crisis, um, which is really shedding light and, and perhaps speeding up some of the changes that were already coming. But I'm wondering if both of you can take a couple of minutes and just kind of sketch out your headline thoughts about what the virus is telling us about the place of both China and the U.S. in the world right now and the changing global order. So, Kishore, why don't we start with you and then Graham, I'll come to you. Well, I think the, it's, as you know, too early to tell what will be the lasting effects of COVID-19. But one thing it has definitely done is I think it has aggravated the U.S.-China geopolitical contest uh, which has already begun and in some ways what this this crisis in revealing the lack of trust between the two powers also indicates the problem that is coming our way and that as you know is what my book uh, as china one is about and i the, one of the key points i make is that in some ways the united states has made a big strategic mistake in launching this geopolitical contest against China without first thinking through a comprehensive long-term strategy on how to deal with this. This, as I say, is an insight given to me by Henry Kissinger. It's an insight that comes from reading George Cannon. And George Cannon, for example, pointed out when the Cold War started that, you know, there's some things we must do. You're gonna take on a big contest. Uh, we must maintain spiritual vitality at home, cultivate friends all over the world, don't insult the Soviet Union and be humble. And what's interesting is that all these tenets of advice that George Cannon gave, which in the end of the day worked for the United States in the Cold War, are being completely ignored today. Mm. And on top of that, there is obviously a major misunderstanding between the US and China, because for Americans, this whole contest is black and white, good and evil, communist and democracy. Mm. But China's primary goal today, and this is the key point that we want to we must try to hoist in, is that China's goal is not to promote communism globally. China, frankly, has no interest in which society becomes communist or non-communist. There's no interest to them. What is of fundamental interest to them is that they want to overcome forever the century of humiliation that they suffered for 100 years from the Opium War of 1842 to the uh, establishment of PRC in 1949 and that those wounds are still alive and well and i mentioned that because some of these wounds are opening in this covid 19 outbreak 
Mm. And so, for example, as you know, when the newspaper calls China the surreal sick man of Asia, it just brought back horrifying memories of how China was trampled on. So when you have a crisis like COVID-19, what it can do, it can either heal and bring people together, or it can bring out, reopen painful wounds again. And that's what I fear COVID-19 is doing to the world today. Mm, okay, that's a that's a great place to start. Graham, uh, jump in and you know add to that, and also if you have any kind of um, intelligence about whether there is communication at the moment, whether is it, there's any kind of uh, coordination between public health officials in the U.S. and China, any kind of discussion. So thank you very much. Let me first say it's an honor to be here with you and <clears throat> the others at the National Institute and with Kishore whom I've known as a colleague for many years and I've learned a lot from. And I like the idea of uh, uh, folks in Singapore offering strategic insights. I think he's following in the footsteps of one of the great strategic thinkers of our lifetime, uh, Lee Kuan Yew. So that's just a start. I, I think uh, uh, coronavirus is like a flash of lightning that illuminates the landscape for a, for a flash, for a moment, that allows us to see some of the contours that are normally obscured by, by the dark. And I think that um, in my understanding of the big picture here, it's just what you're asking for, that I'd make three points. First, coronavirus is an existential threat to the most vital interest of the USA which is the survival and well-being of Americans. Simultaneously, it's an existential threat to the most vital interest of China, which is the survival and well-being of its people. And in this case, uh, it poses a threat that neither state can uh, defeat by itself. So, uh, we discover in the reality of coronavirus that if China succeeds in stamping it out altogether and it's rampant in the U.S. for some time, there'll be re-entry. So the second wave and the third wave. So this is a place that emphasizes that there's a shared interest that we have to address for our selfish, selfish interest. That's the first point. Second point, this is layered on top of structural realities that cannot be denied. So the big picture that I try to develop in my Destined for War book is to say, look at the structural realities, which actually happen to the seesaw of power in each dimension. And there's no question that China is the meteoric rising power, that as it rises, it impacts positions and prerogatives Americans have become accustomed to at the top of every pecking order for a century, an American century, and that this is a classic Thucydidean and rivalry with all that entails. And then there's a big tale to that. But it certainly entails, as you said, or as, it was, as was said in the intro, a substantially increase of increased risk of war, real, deadly, bloody war, maybe even catastrophic war. So that's the, that the second point. And the third point is uh, then if we imagine that you had rational adults running both the U.S. and China, I know that would be a, a bold, a bold uh, uh, assumption. But if that were the case, if uh, either faces a existential threat, it can't defeat by itself, even if they're in a Thucydidean rivalry, Can, could they find their way to some uh, version of partnership, even a limited partnership, or what uh, uh, I have written about as a quote, rivalry partnership, taking a page from ancient Chinese wisdom uh, that uh, in, the, in the treaty that the, that the Song developed with the Liao in 1005 that only provided a century of peace. So I, I think there's a three big ideas, and I think how this settles will be unclear. The, the hope that somehow 
This will lead us to set aside all our differences and get back to engagement and cooperation as usual is naive. The, the, the rivalry is baked in to the structure of the relationship. On the other hand, the notion that either party can deal with either coronavirus or with climate disruption or indeed with risks of nuclear weapon by itself is also naive. So can we find our way? I think it's possible that this could actually help motivate, a, a, could be a learning moment for building what, what actually Xi Jinping called for, a new, a new form of great power relations. Okay, that's, um, that's a great point to, to pivot. Um, and let me just say, I'm gonna ask uh, a few more questions, but you all should feel free to jump in, um, respond to one another, um, redirect if you like. Let me ask one more question before we move on to kind of the bigger, broader, long-term structural shifts that are underway. Let me ask one more virus-specific question. Um, and Keisha, I'll start with you. The title of your book is How China, uh, Has China Won? And I'm curious, in the context of the virus and the handling of the virus, how you see that? I mean, in some ways, uh, it has illuminated both the strengths and the weaknesses of uh, the, the, the systems in China and the US. In China, uh, you know, China's come under fire for opacity in terms of communication at the beginning of the handling of the virus. On the other hand, they've been able to implement policies that have gotten it under control very quickly in ways that European countries and the U.S. have struggled with. These are the, the issues that we face in a liberal democracy. So has China won uh, in the context of the virus? And then blow, blow that out, uh, you know, uh, beyond, beyond that topic, if you like. And Graham, feel free to jump in. Well, I think, by the way, let me say that actually, it's, for me, it's an honor to be with Graham. He's the guru in the relationship, as you know, in, in Asia. And it was a pleasure to be with you, Rana. But I, I, I want to emphasize, of course, uh, by the way, uh, that we are really in the, as they say, in the thick of battle, in the fog of war. We have no idea how COVID-19 is going to end right now. I think anybody who thinks he knows what the ending is, is, is obviously deluding himself. This, this could either become much bigger or, or settle down or whatever it is, you know. But as of now, if you take a snapshot of where we are, I think COVID-19 has reinforced some perceptions that were sort of growing of China and of the United States. And in the case of China, I think, frankly, the rest of the world was beginning to accept the reality that this was not going to be a sclerotic communist party system, that something very dynamic and very vibrant was happening uh, to China. And structurally, if you look at, at, at China today, it is it, it's a very basic thing. Yeah? Uh, for, for thousands of years, the Chinese never utilized the brains of 80 to 90 percent of their population. Mm. It's only in the last 30 to 40 years, yeah? by massive education, access to health, access to modern world, now 1.4 billion people's brains are being tapped and the best are being funneled upwards to a very careful meritocratic system of selection. So at the end of the day, you get, you get the quality of mind in the institutions, which is absolutely remarkable. And the professionals who deal with their Chinese counterparts are amazed at how well informed and how clear they are in their thinking about many of these issues. So what's happening in, in, in the United States, in, in China is that you have a very efficient meritocratic government and which, is, which, which you're right, it stumbled in the first phase of dealing with COVID-19. But once it picked itself up, my God, it, it just took the, such dramatic action of closing down a province of 60 million people two days before Chinese New Year. <laughs> Believe me, that's shocking. Mm. It, you know, it's like closing up the United States two days before Thanksgiving, right? Mm. It doesn't happen. Yeah. So that's the kind of dramatic action they take. That's a meritocracy. And in the case of the United States, sadly, COVID-19 has then brought out the structural weaknesses that have developed in American society. 
and uh, the sort of uh, delegitimization of public agencies, the sort of the scorn put on government. And remember Ronald Reagan's famous statement, government is not the solution. Mm -hmm. Government is the problem. And so what's happened is that the United States has not been sucking talent into the government sector. And so all the government agencies are struggling. You, all your talent has gone to banking, into finance, into consultancy, and so on and so forth, which is wonderful if everything is going fine. But the minute you have a crisis like this, when you actually need better government agencies to deal with it, then all the weaknesses are beginning to show. So as of now, you ask any reasonably well-informed person, in Africa, in Latin America, in Asia. And I can tell you, by the way, my friends in Asia are absolutely shocked at how unprepared and how, in, in some ways, how chaotic the response of the United States has been. And if I can put one point very, very delicately, it's actually quite shocking that it was the West that exported modern science and technology to the world, but there's far greater respect for science in China, Mm. South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, than you see in the U.S. administration. A, a kind of remarkably ignorant statements are being made at the highest levels, and people are scratching their heads. Said, "How can how can that happen?" So clearly, as of now, I would say clearly, the China standing in the world has gone up, and the United States has gone down. Sad. Okay. Graham, jump in. Do you agree? So I would say uh, yes and no. So I think uh, it's complicated, but there's no question if you took a snapshot today and did the balance sheet, that in terms of numbers of new infections and numbers of deaths, uh, China has been more successful than the U.S. And I think watching the U.S., uh, one's often dismayed at the incompetence or the floundering or the inability to come to grips with things. So I agree with that. Secondly, I agree with Kishore. The most, the, the most important truth about coronavirus are the uncertainties. So we are in the fog of war today. This is not over. Nobody knows how this ends. And so the, this is, I compare it to, uh, if this were a war against coronavirus, as President Trump has declared, we're in the first phase of a war. So then third, uh, I believe your point is exactly right, that this helps illuminate some of the systemic strengths and weaknesses of the two systems, one a party-led autocracy and one a democracy, a decentralized democracy, but also in particular about these two governments and their capabilities. And I think there, Kishore's proposition about the ways in which Americans have disinvested in competence in government. On the one hand, as China has invested, is evident for anybody who engages with Chinese officials and sees how, what their competence is, what their capabilities. I also agree with him that the ways in which China has harnessed its talent uh, for uh, uh, over these years, after having so many years wasted it, is quite remarkable. But all that being said, I subscribe to uh, a proposition that uh, uh, the most, the world's most successful investor, Warren Buffett, uh, frequently repeats. He says, nobody ever made money uh, in the long run selling the U.S. short. Hmm. So let me say it again. No one ever made money in the long run selling the U.S. short. So I think it remains uncertain what happens in the second inning, the third inning, and the fourth inning. And I just remind you this from a historical perspective. In general, democracies do not do very well in the first innings. If you had, if you had ended the, the Revolutionary War in 1776, Britain wins. If you had ended World War I before the Americans got there, uh, the Germans win. If you had ended the, the European War, before the Americans arrived, which you almost did. Hitler would be, you would be speaking German. So. <laughs>
Um, these, these are great points, and I love that you're bringing up these historical analogies. They're so relevant right now. Um, whilst I don't want to disagree with Warren Buffett, I'll be a little bit of a contrarian and say, you know, if we were ever going to be talking about um, a post-American world, a post-dollar order, um, this is a good moment to be talking about that. I mean, we have a situation now um, in response to this crisis where the U.S is on track to have an incredibly enlarged debt and deficit picture. Um, you know, for, for years, we've all been talking about how, oh my gosh, post-financial crisis, China grew the biggest debt bubble of all time. Well, the U.S. is now growing, a, you know, if not comparable, a pretty, you know, by, by our standards, a pretty big debt bubble. Um, arguably not as well equipped to handle that. At the same time, you've got all these trends that were happening already. Um, China and many other countries wanting to move to a world that is less dependent on the dollar, less dependent on American leadership. The decoupling that was already underway now being put on steroids, and, and Keisha, going to your point, you know, might have been nice in the U.S. to have a, a administration that thought about the fact that, you know, we're getting 96 cent of the antibiotic supply chain from China before starting a trade war. Um, whatever, whatever one might think you do seem to have this bipolar world developing now. So if you all could both take a minute, I know that's a big question, but kind of sketch out for us, what are the key things we need to be thinking about geopolitically and economically in that new, more bipolar world, assuming we're, we're not really gonna reset to the 1990s, which I think probably all of us would agree with. Uh, three, three quick points. Uh, firstly, I completely agree by the way, actually we Graham, that uh, it's unwise to bet against the United States. In fact, my book begins with a fictional memo to Xi Jinping saying, we have now begun a great struggle against the United States. Uh, of course, we will win, but whatever we do, we must never underestimate this country. And to give you one, one line I use in the book, I say that China has produced one Mao Zedong, America has produced a thousand Mao Zedong, right? You mm -hmm. have Bill Gates, you have uh, the founder of Apple. Uh, so, you know, you have all these incredible giants strutting around America. So it, it'd, be a, it'd be a major mistake to underestimate uh, America. But the second point I'd make is that at the same time, because America lacks a strategy, it is not looking at where its vulnerabilities are. And in my book, actually, I, I say exactly what you said, Rana. If I had to point to one Achilles heel, that America has in this contest against China, and I'm sure China is aware of this Achilles heel, is the fact that the US dollar is the global reserve currency. And that gives America an exorbitant privilege. And even though uh, the, uh, President Trump complains about trade imbalances, actually the rest of the world is very envious of these trade imbalances mm -hmm. because you can print money and import lots of goods that other people have to work very hard to produce. But the danger there is that it is as you know, over time, whenever the number one economy becomes the number two economy, its role as a global reserve currency goes down. We don't know exactly when that's going to happen. But there is actually an acute danger that the Chinese could accelerate the process by creating a kind of what they call a, a digital currency based on mm. uh, AI. And that's technically possible and that provides the avenues for countries around the world to trade with each other without having to use the US dollar. That's, that's technically possible. It hasn't been done yet. And so the, the, the third point is that at the end of the day, the, the people who are going to decide whether in this bipolar world US wins or China wins is not the 330 million people in America, not the 1.4 billion people in China, but the 6 billion people who live outside. And what's interesting is that the 6 billion people who live outside today, the elites, and you deal with them, are extremely well informed. They're, they're educated at the best universities in, in Grant's place, Harvard, and so on and so forth. So they do this, they, they use the cold calculus of reason to work out a cost benefit analysis of which country provides them more in real things, okay, real things, mm. right? Not speeches, not rhetoric. Mm. Right. If you need a new power station, if you need a new port, if you need a new hospital, where do you go? And increasingly, 
this is just pure data. Mm. More and more countries are knocking on the doors of China. And so what the Chinese are doing are systematically building up a global network of influence where, where countries are relying on China for real things, not for words. Mm. And by contrast, the United States has been withdrawing from the world in real terms. Mm. And that creates the difference of where the directions of the world are going. So that's why I don't think China has won yet, but it's an absolute mistake for Americans to think that China cannot win. Okay, Graham, do you want to jump in um, on this? Let me both agree and disagree. So I think certainly I applaud Kishore's effort in the book to wake Americans up from complacency. So for lots of Americans, they believe that America's number one position is so naturally ensconced uh, that it cannot be possibly be challenged. That's a f foolish idea. Uh, so I think, as I've tried to argue, we have to appreciate that this is a genuine Thucydide rivalry. Indeed, if I'm, I'm, I'm in China, or I had been in China every other month uh, since the book was published, and I talked to many of the Chinese leaders, they always say, well, well what do you think about uh, the, your Thucydides proposition now? And I say, well, if Thucydides were watching, he would say both parties are right on script, almost as if they were competing to see which will better exemplify the rising power and which the ruling power. And he would say, if I had been stretching my imagination, I could not have imagined a better uh, uh, symbol for the ruling power than Donald Trump or the rising power than Xi Jinping. So that's the, that fundamental is happening in any case. Then the question is how each of the parties manage their hand. And here I think maybe Kishore and I have a slight disagreement, but I, I say in the conclusion of my Destined for War book that if somebody from, if a serious strategist from Mars or Lee Kuan Yew, for example, were watching these two countries, he would say pretty much what Lee Kuan Yew said, which is each of you have a big problem that you're probably gonna fail to solve. Most of that problem lies inside your own borders, not abroad, not with the other party, inside your own borders. One of you has got a, a party-led autocratic system, which is a 20th century operating system on which you're trying to paste 21st century apps and that's not going to work. That's what he said. And yeah. the other has a democracy that's demonstrably dysfunctional. I mean, I call it DC stands for dysfunctional capital. So, and you're going to have to determine whether you can revive your democracy and reinvent it again to show that it governs because either of these societies could go awry. Mm. In the Chinese story, we know frequently autocracies end up with bad emperors. So Mao happened after uh, the founding of the Republic. Mm. In the history of China, many instances of, quote, bad emperors. Indeed, it's extremely hard to keep a benevolent dictator or autocrat benevolent. Mm. We also know about the democracies, that they have their problems, and in particular, the American democracy today. So I, I think this, this is a contest that will go on for some time, but whichever society can better deliver to its citizens what they want, will end up uh, demonstrating which has got a more successful system. And I think neither of the parties uh, have solved that problem today. Well, you know, you're, this is this is a fascinating point. I'm I'm reminded of something a very smart source once told me, which is that, you know, it may be that the fortunes of either uh, country depend on who can best control the money to leads, because as you're sketching out, there are vested interests, strong vested interests in both countries that have a lot uh, invested in keeping things the way they are. Now, I'm curious how you all see this. Um, you know, the chances of both China and the U.S. being able to break out of the current paradigm and make the reforms, either in the case of China, uh, to, to reform the economy, to get rid of the, the, you know, the old, less productive ways of funneling capital, state-run enterprises, et cetera, the kind of 
links between between the party and and that that system uh how that compares to america's ability to navigate at a time when everything that's happened in the last few weeks um not to mention the last few years is forwarding a system that is going to make things more polarized potentially increase populism um who's best positioned i mean how does the current landscape what if you were if you were in vegas betting uh <laughs> um or hong kong what, what what would you what would you say well should i start yeah please yeah um well the you know you know i by the way i completely agree with um graham when he talks about the structural problems of autocracies and uh how do you ensure you have a good successor when you have a benevolent leader and so on and so forth that's all that's true but you know chinese civilization also has its own cycles mm. and when a successful dynasty emerges and by the way in terms of how much the standard of living of the chinese people have improved so far the current chinese government has done more to improve the standard of living of chinese people in the last 40 years than any government has done for the past 4000 years so what china may be seeing is the beginning of a new dynastic cycle which normally lasts 300 years and it's sure at the end of 300 years as you saw in the qing dynasty things start to fall apart but we are now only about 40 to 70 years in a 300 year cycle so that's why i would say don't bet against china also and in the case of the United States, I'm glad you used the phrase uh, vested interest because I have a chapter called Can America Make U-Turns? And give, just give you one concrete example. The real contest between the United States and China is not going to be played out in the military sphere. There'll be no all-out war. I think Graham would agree in a nuclear war, you don't have a winner and a loser, you have a loser and a loser. So the real battle is going to be in the economy. And that's why the United States won against the Soviet Union. And yet, despite the fact that it is not going to be played out in the military, the United States is still supporting a fleet of 13 aircraft carriers. And increasingly, these aircraft carriers can no longer fly close to the Chinese coast because the Chinese have developed hypersonic missiles for $100,000 that can destroy a $13 billion aircraft carrier. So it doesn't make sense to spend so much money on aircraft carriers anymore. So what you need to do is to completely change the defense budget and orient it towards a new military strategy to deal with the United States. But what, what happens when you try to change the US, the US defense budget? Every congressman, every senator has got a slice of the pie in the defense budget, which is untouchable. And as you know, defense secretaries have tried their hardest to cut the defense budget, and I give a concrete example in the book, where when the defense <laughs> secretary asks for X million, Congress gives X, X plus few hundred million so that some can go to the districts. Now, that's not how you fight a long-term strategic battle, mm. right? Mm. So these are the examples of the examples of in the case of the United States, where decisions are made not to benefit the larger national interest, not to benefit the people as a whole, but to benefit a small, a small group of people. And that's why, as I say, the real contest today between US and China is between a plutocracy and a meritocracy, mm -hmm. and don't underestimate a meritocracy in such a struggle. Okay, um, I'm conscious we're getting close to the question time, but before we open it up, let me, let me um, let's talk about the rest of the world for a moment and how um, Europe and, and Southeast Asia and other parts of the world play into what's happening now. Um, I'm fascinated if you all have a view on whether we will be in a truly bipolar world going forward or whether Europe will provide some kind of third way, some kind of uh, counterbalance to this great pow power rivalry. I'm particularly interested in your thoughts on um, the, the trade and tech war within that. One thing I find fascinating right now is how Europe is being pushed um, in 5G, for example, to either go with China or the US. And you know, in this world, and if you assume that at some point Europe will have to pick sides, at least from a from a kind of a tech hardware standpoint, can it can there be a third way? Um, where does this end? So that's one question. Secondly, Southeast Asia, the Middle East, West Africa, you know, whole new games of great power politics happening there. Um, what is most concerning to you? What would you call out? Graham, do you want to grab that one first? 
So uh, great, it's a great question. And again, nobody knows, but uh, speculation. I, I, I think I foresee a world in which we've got a Thucydidean and rivalry between two great powers. And that's the principal defining dynamic of international relations for as far as we can see. Each of them are on a path to decouple elements of the relationship that provide uh, vital, uh, uh, that to, to, to decouple any, any dependence on anything that's vital for them. So if you look across first the defense sector, but now the tech sector, uh, uh, China is doing everything it can not to be dependent on advanced semiconductors from the U.S. and U.S. Uh, patents uh, because they don't like that vulnerability. And you can see in the U.S. looking at the supply chains and noticing that many, many items, ingredients, just as you said, come from China. And so the U.S. will be pressing there. So that's the fundamental dynamic. But at the same time, if you go to Australia or Singapore or Japan, America's closest side, or the Europeans, and you talk to their leaders, which I've done to, with many, they say, don't make us choose between our uh, economic relationship with China, which is essential for our prosperity, and our security relationship with you, which is essential for our security. So we're not gonna choose. Or if we did, you wouldn't like the way we chose. So I think this is going to be a much more complex uh, relationship. China is not the uh, isolated, uh, autarkic uh, uh, economy that the Soviet Union was. So it wasn't hard to isolate the Soviet economy because they were trying to isolate themselves. In fact, China is the largest trading partner of almost everybody. That's going to remain. So the, cha the economic piece of this will be thick. On the other hand, if you ask again, when I listen to leaders in Japan or Singapore or, uh, or uh, South Korea, uh, if they imagine the world without the US as a security counterbalance to China, they say, don't leave us alone with China. They don't think China is going to invade them. They don't think, I agree with Kishore, they don't think it wants to impose a Communist Party with troops the way the Soviet Union did, but they believe that the Chinese will squeeze them in ways that will be harmful to their well-being without a balance. So I think we're going to have a much more complex. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the third the third party actors will make this competition considerably more complex than what we saw in the so-called bipolar world of the Cold War. Okay, great. Um, well, we already have, we have about 15 minutes left and we already have a number of questions. And um, I've written a book about technology, but you're now going to have a real time uh, test of, of whether or not I can actually make this technology work. Um, I see that Henry Makem uh, has a question. Um, Dinda and Nina, do I click or, is, or can Henry just click in himself? Looks like he's up. Hi, can you hear me? Lovely. We can hear you. Go ahead. Perfect. So I'm curious in terms of, I guess, sort of examining the sort of the, the great power rivalry going on now, vis-a-vis -vis middle powers, for instance, Australia or South Korea, Japan, et cetera, have deep economic relationships with China, but have a strong defense relationship with the US. To what extent will we see uh, pressure applied from either the Chinese or the US going forward for middle powers to make a choice? Uh, and I guess in terms of uh, the second question to that is, I'm curious as to whether middle powers who are stuck or in, in such a conundrum have been talking about creating a de facto or if not de jure alliance to be able to have some sort of economy of scale uh, when dealing with uh, very difficult economic and strategic questions that might be forced upon them uh, in, in light of the ongoing uh, power rivalry. Okay, um, either of you wanna grab that one? Sure, right. I, I, go ahead. No, no, just uh, very quickly on, 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 on Australia. Uh, I think, you know, I, I, what I say in the book is that uh, when, if this geopolitical contest becomes uh, stronger and stronger, and I fear it will, some of the countries that will be very badly affected will be countries like Australia and Singapore, because, you know, Australia has got very, very solid defense relationship with the uh, United States. 
but a complete its economy is tied almost 70 percent to to china so countries like australia i think are going to have a very very hard time which is why i think the key point that graham made earlier which i think i hope many americans will listen carefully to is the rest of the world the six billion are people we are saying please don't make us choose mm. we want to continue uh, pursuing our economic ties with china and yes, we want to keep on our relationship uh, with the United States. And Graham is absolutely right when he says that uh, the countries, for example, in Southeast Asia, would like to see a U.S. presence remain in the region. We don't want the U.S. to leave. We want the, the U.S. to be here. But at the same time, we want a delicate, sensitive, thoughtful, considerate U.S. presence that understands that, you know, we have to live with China for the next 1,000 years. So don't make us, force us to take decisions that will end up in the long run getting us in trouble. So I'll give you a concrete example. You mentioned technology. The United States has launched a tremendous campaign against Huawei, right? And it claims that if you take Huawei, you, you know, China will be spying on you. But you see, everybody knows through Edward Snowden, the U.S. spies on you too. So what's the difference as far as you're concerned? Whether the U.S. spies on you, China spies on you, everybody's going to spy on you. So what's the problem there? So when, when, when the United States keeps pushing countries in, 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 in that direction, it will alienate a lot of countries. And we are moving at the end of the day. One key word that hasn't surfaced here is that we are moving towards a multipolar world with many actors. One actor, for example, that has not been mentioned is India. Mm. I think <laughs> India is going to be <laughs> India is going to be a big India is going to be a big swing factor in this game because only India is big enough to really uh, uh, match the two elephants, U.S. and China. But that's an example of the and, and I think that one one word which I think Bram used, which we should emphasize, is the word complexity. This is not black and white. This is a very complex game. Many players and many different nuances are coming. And you've got to absorb that complexity if you want to understand the world that's coming. Okay, Graham, I'll, do you want I'll to just, quickly jump I'll in? I'm just trying to make one, one comment. I mean, mostly I agree, but I think the, for the, for the uh, middle powers, they're going to find this extremely painful because they are going to be pulled in both directions. They will... The U.S. will demand that they not do Huawei, and some of them will do part Huawei, and this will become another strain. Uh, they will try to organize themselves if they can, and a great example of that is what Prime Minister Abe did in resurrecting TPP after the U.S. dropped out. So that club of trade provides some counterbalance to China's weight. So basically, if the U.S. had been part of it, you would have had 40% of the world's GDP on one side of the seesaw and China's, you know, 18% on the other side. So that's a much better, uh, you get much better terms if you're negotiating those in that manner. I just remind us of Thucydides' line from the millions. In this real world, the strong do what they will and the weak suffer what they must. So mm. I think that'll be the fate of the middle powers. Okay, I see Peter Walker's waiting for a question. Let me let me let you in, Peter. Go ahead, Peter. Can you can you speak? I think you've got your mic muted, so you might want to try. Okay. There you go. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. We got you. Yeah, I completely agree with Kishore's point that at the end of the day, this is all going to be about economics. Um, I also agree with the point that if you look at the economic momentum of China, the fact that it has four times as many people, that uh, its productivity through urbanization still has a long way to go. And if you look at the lift they're going to get from the Belt Road Initiative and 2025, it's hard to imagine their relative performance economically to the U.S. will not continue for the foreseeable future. So my question, uh, especially for Kishore, is to the extent his book is a wake-up call for America, which I totally agree with, what is it going to take for that to happen? And what would be the consequences of that wake-up call? Thank you. Okay. Um, 
what's what's it going to take? I unfortunately, the history teaches us that it takes a crisis uh, for people to wake up. And at the end of the day, maybe after COVID nineteen, uh, people will start looking at the world afresh and say, "How do we keep ourselves safe and secure?" in this in this very different world and i think one one other dimension i want to emphasize is that that hasn't been put in the picture here is that people ordinary people around the world are aware that actually we live in a very small interconnected densely packed what they call maybe a global village and the spread of covid 19 shows that we live in a small village so if you live in a small densely packed uh, uh, village then clearly you, you have to learn to get along with your neighbors and work with your neighbors. And, and, and I hope that, that that sounds like a very uh, idealistic di uh, way of putting it. But if the primary goal of the United States is to improve the well-being of its people, the United States can improve the well-being of its people by cooperating with the rest of the world rather than by engaging in another zero-sum uh, geopolitical contest. Because as, as Graham mentioned earlier, when he goes around the world and talks to people and so on and so forth, more and more countries in the world want to engage America. They want to work with America. So what America needs to do is to seize this opportunity by, mm -hmm. by changing its strategy. And instead of imposing demands on other countries, learn to practice diplomacy, look for win-win arrangements, go back and rejoin the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is, which as Graham Allison said, was a gift to America. There's so many things that America can do right if it, if it can somehow or other wake up and realize that this is a different world today. Okay, let me try and bring in a couple more voices. Richard Merti has his hand up. Richard, do you want to click in? Yes, thank you. This is Richard Myrtle. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great, thank you. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm an American citizen. I live in New York City right now. Uh, and I am completely on board with working with the Chinese. I actually lived in China for many years and I speak Chinese. So, so I, I'm completely on board with working with the Chinese in a new economic order for the world. Um, but I grew up in the, in, you know, in, the, in the 1980s, in the waning years of the Cold War, under this cloud of the threat of nuclear war. And so when, you know, when the Soviet Union imploded and the Berlin Wall fell in, in, the, in, the, uh, you know, in 18, 1989, that was like a huge breath of, breath of fresh air for me. And I've, I've been living very peacefully ever since until recently. Um, in this discussion, Rana made the point about vested interests uh, in the two countries and, and certain, uh, certain parts of the society that just want to protect the status quo. And I'm not concerned about the moneyed, um, you know, the moneyed uh, elite in either country. I, I, I believe that Warren Buffett will, will certainly pivot uh, very nimbly in this matter as well. What I'm concerned about is the military deep state in the United States. And I want to ask Graham Allison, in your theory of the, the, city's, the city's trap, what is your view on the on the threat and the and the danger of uh, nuclear war uh, going forward? And is there anything you know? How frightened are you about that? And assuming that you're as frightened as I am about it, what can is there anything we can do? Thank you. So th thank you. It's a great question and a long would take a long answer, but the answer is yes. You should be concerned about nuclear war, uh, and. In the Thucydidean dynamic, the trigger to war is rarely the, 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 the choice of the rising power to attack the ruling power, or alternatively, the ruling power to attack the rising power. Instead, what happens is some third party's action or provocation, or even just an event, triggers a vicious cycle of reactions that drags people to a war they don't want. Think 1914 and the assassination of an archduke. So in the current situation, Taiwan is a ticking time bomb. As Taiwan watches what's happening on the mainland, its interest in being reintegrated, the way Hong Kong has been, has dropped to zero. Uh, many people in the Trump administration, and certainly some of the in Congress, have been emboldening Taiwan to take steps 
towards uh, a greater independence. If, if Taiwan were to take a sharp move towards independence in the current setting, I believe, and most people that study China believe Beijing would react violently and by the end of the day, reintegrate China, force reintegrate Taiwan forcibly. If the US came to the support of Taiwan, which we might, it's not clear, but if we did, I think we would have a war with China. And uh, from there, it's not hard to, talk, to identify or to trace an escalation ladder that would end up with nuclear bombs exploding. So for those of us that lived through the Cold War, it's, we should think not about somebody wanting a nuclear war, but about getting dragged somewhere no sane person would want to go. And we should never forget 1914. I think you can't study it too much. Okay. Um, let me bring in another voice. Brian Gilmore, you're on. Brian, can you, um, can you hear us? I think you've got your mic muted. So if you want to try and unmute. Or not. Um, we'll try uh, Zachary Klein. Hi. How's it going? This has been an excellent panel. And I, I think everyone's had some amazing points to offer. And it's been very educational. Uh, I want to pivot back to something. Uh, that was said about uh, the structural weaknesses in the United States. And my question is, is to what extent are these weaknesses structural and to what extent are they caused by the current occupant in the White House? Um, one could argue that we have the current leadership we do simply because there's a lack of faith and trust in institutions and that, that simply result of that weakness uh, that Kishore was talking about. Um, is this something that we can bounce back from with just a, a different president or set of leadership in Congress and agencies, or is this something that is more systemic? Well, if I, if I, if I had to give the answer, Rana, uh, you know, I, I, I studied philosophy, and I actually studied a philosopher called John Rawls very carefully. Mm. And if you find in my book, you find I cite John Rawls many times, and if John Rawls were alive today, he will be absolutely shocked by what's happening to the bottom 10% in America. And also, the United States today is the only major developed society where the average income of the bottom 50, 50% has gone down over a 30 year period. And this doesn't happen, this happened way before President Trump. It's got nothing to do with the current administration. It's the result of deep structural flaws in the decision-making processes in the United States that have led to this surge of inequality, has led to what Case and Deaton call the sea of despair among white working classes and so on and so forth. And in fact, it would be very good for the United States to, instead of focus, instead of starting a new geopolitical contest against China and wasting resources on it, why not use those resources to take care of the sea of despair among the white working classes, take care of his own people first. And, and that's why I believe at the end of the day, if the United States concentrates on improving the well-being of its people, which, which where the bottom 50% is suffering, and China concentrates on improving the well-being of its people, we can get out of the Thucydides trap that Graham has been talking about so eagerly. Okay. Um, I'm going to grab one or two more questions, and then I'm going to be turning it over to Dinda. Why don't we take Eric Tucker and then Peggy Blumenthal? Hi, just unmuting. Hi. Um, so my question is uh, regarding Xi Jinping: Is is he the rightful per, the the right character to lead China forward? And to what degree is he riding on the the coattails of um, his predecessors, notably Deng Xiaoping, who set uh, things on certain course, and certainly Zhu Rongji, who um, enable China to get into the WTO? And to what degree is China uh, beholden both to the other rising Asian powers of obviously uh, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore? And as an aside, also every one of those powers has gradually opened, has become less authoritarian. 
Under Xi Jinping, China is now reversing. And the implications of that reversal may still be in play. And to his credit, of course, he did reduce corruption, but he did it in a way that did not uh, enable a, an institutionalized transparency to monitor corruption. He did it in a capricious way that many argue favored his own political interests. So um, certainly China has had great success. It owes a lot of that success to the openness of the US market and the global system. And I think it's important to stop thinking of it as the US system anymore. There's been tremendous beneficiaries to a global system and obviously China can contribute, but I'm just, I feel like there's more complaint than appreciation. Okay, uh, I'll leave it there. I'm gonna, Sorry, I'm thank gonna you. stop you for a minute and I'm gonna ask Peggy to also give her question, um, a short question, and then we'll let the panelists take them both at once. Peggy, go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, because it actually follows up on this past question. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yep, we got you. Good. Um, and it was uh, Kishore Mambabani's um, description of China as a meritocracy uh, versus what the U.S. is now. And I wondered how, when you look at Chinese higher education and U.S. higher education and how important a role education plays in growing the global talent, would you really describe Chinese universities today as meritocracies? And is the Xi Jinping's increasing political crackdown on them going to help them uh, move into that place as the global host for talent? Okay, great. Thanks, Peggy. Graham, you want to go first and then? Sure. Uh, on Xi Jinping, I have a profile in my book, which is the only thing that the Chinese censors insisted on uh, eliminating from the Mandarin edition of it uh, for their sensitivities. But I say, and I believe, that he is the most ambitious, most competent, and likely to be the most consequential actor on the international stage today. So that's a big one-liner. Uh, and I think on the meritocracy, uh, if I understand, there's no question that the uh, Chinese universities have made huge, huge strides forward. Tsinghua is a great university. Beida is a great university. But if I look at the uh, processes for admission and promotion there and compare them with the American universities, and if I look at actually the, those as competitions in themselves, which I do, I would say that it's hard to conclude China is more meritocratic. Both of them make exceptions, but I think in the Chinese case, I would suspect more so. Kishore. Well, I, I also discuss uh, Xi Jinping in, in, in my book. And I would, uh, one thing I want to emphasize is that we really don't know him as a person. He sees a bit of a mystery. But at the same time, we know why he accumulated more power than his predecessors. Because before him, the regime before him, two big problems were sprouting up. One was corruption, which was mentioned earlier, and the other was factionalism. And the Chinese knew that if this continued, if corruption continued, factionalism continued, the Chinese regime would collapse and China's goal to rejuvenate itself would have all died. So he was like an emergency doctor sent in to solve a major, like a cardiac arrest that was happening in China. And that's why he acted uh, so, so decisively. And of course, if you look at China through any set of liberal lenses, mm -hmm. China seems to be going backwards. But if you look at the China from the lenses of the 1.4 billion people and what they actually want, there is absolutely no question that the Chinese people, because their number one fear is chaos, Luan, when they have a strong leader in charge, they feel relaxed, they feel good. My life is secure. Finally, it's, it's the opposite of a strong leader that is a problem uh, in China. So when Xi Jinping accumulates as much power as he has and acts as decisively as he does, He's responding to a Chinese political culture, a Chinese political dynamic. And at the end of the day, the only thing you're going to judge Xi by, by the way, is results. Mm. Is he keeping the economy growing? Are people's lives improving? Is China standing in the world growing up? And so on and so forth. So if you look at the results, and here I agree with Graham, 
there is actually no doubt that the single most consequential leader, real consequential leader in the world today is Xi Jinping. Because it's the decision he makes that are now determining what's happening in the world. Okay. Um, well, we could keep going. And I, I feel like this should maybe be a series. I'm putting in my, my bid um, for, for another round with you all at some point. Um, I'm going to um, thank you both. I know we've got a couple more questions, but Dinda needs to come in as well. And I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So um, thank you, Kishore. Thank you, Graham. I've learned a lot um, more soon from you, I hope. And Dinda, back to you. Thank you. Uh, wow, I just want to thank the three of you for providing an incredible framework for how we might be able to find our way forward through this crisis and through the uh, shifting global order um, and giving us a little bit of a sense of what the future might look like. Uh, you know, a handful of takeaways or words that popped out to me were complexity. Um, these are not black and white issues. That's something that we Americans have a hard time with, I think. Um, and that we are living in a small village. Um, and we hope that the, that the world will not have to choose between the United States and China. So I just want to thank you so, so very much, um, Kishore Mabubani, Graham Allison, Rana Fruhar. Finally, I wanted to um, encourage people to become members of China Institute. Um, it's a way to uh, help us continue um, you know, doing these programs and bringing these dialogues and discussions um, to all of you. And so we would very much appreciate your, your joining as members. And uh, thank you all so much for attending. We look forward to seeing you at our future programs. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.